Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. No amount of money is worth your peace. And no amount of money is worth the stress that you end up with if you've got a schedule that never leaves you any time for anything except to run, 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 run all the time. I simply want to talk to you this weekend about making right choices. Because many of you who are attending this conference and even many of you watching by television are Christians. You do have Christ in your life. Hopefully and prayerfully that leads you to make better choices. But there are multiplied millions of Christians all over the world who still make bad choices every day. But every choice that we make literally is the seed that we sow. And every seed that we sow will bring some kind of harvest in our life. We're going to talk about wisdom this weekend. The Bible has a lot to say about wisdom and how, how good it is to be wise and how foolish it is to be foolish. And wisdom, and I want you to remember this, if you're taking notes you can write it down, but I believe that wisdom And this is not a, like a fancy biblical definition, but this is my definition of wisdom, and I think it's right, that wisdom always chooses to do now what it will be satisfied with later on. You got that? Wisdom chooses to do right now what it will be satisfied with later on. Let's talk about money for a minute. 1 Timothy 6.10 says the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is evil. It says loving money is evil. And I, this is my personal opinion. I think one of the reasons why God asks us to give a portion of our money away, the first fruits of all your increase, so this is a lifetime ongoing thing. Every time you get a little something, God wants you to give a little of it away. Why does he do that? Because he never wants us to love money. And the only way that you can ever be assured that you won't get greedy is to be generous. Did you hear me? I said the only way that you can fight greed is with generosity. And we should be afraid of greed more than any other single thing because the Bible says that greed takes away the life of its possessor. Let's just think about a couple of hypothetical situations. Let's just say George has a nice family, a wife whom he loves, a couple of kids whom he adores. He's got a job that's not too far from home. He doesn't have to spend a lot of gas to get there. He works hard during the week, but he's never required to put in overtime hours, and he has good benefits, you know, really, really nice benefits. He's not in management. He's not in leadership, but George has got a good life. He loves God, he loves his family, loves his wife, he's got joy, he's got peace. And he gets offered a job from another company. They heard what a good employee he was and they offered him another job in management where he'd have his own office, his own parking place with his name on it. That's big, you know. <laughs> and he would make another $200 a month. Well, he takes the job because of the extra money and also because of the little bit of importance he was going to feel being a boss and having his own name on this parking place and so on and so forth. But the truth is, is now that he has people working under him, he's got a lot more responsibility. Every time something goes wrong at the company, he's expected to be there. The electricity goes out on the weekend. He's got to be there on the weekend. So long story short, he ends up missing church a lot. He's not home nearly as much as he used to be. And when he is, he's rather frustrated and worn out because he's working too much. And by the way, he was really disappointed when he got that, his check that month and noticed that after federal tax and state tax and city tax and social security tax, <laughs> he didn't get that much of that $200 anyway. And then 
He had to dress differently at that job, so he had to buy some better clothes, and it was further away, so he had to buy more gas, and it, more gas, and it was more wear and tear on his car. So he finally ended up realizing that maybe he was clearing $65 to $70 a month. And for that money, he sold his happy little life. And so for $65 a month, he got stress, headaches, stomach aches, marriage problems, and his relationship with God became weaker and weaker. Or then there's Susie who has three kids, and her husband has a nice job. And, you know, they, he makes good money. They're comfortable. They're not rich, but they're comfortable. And they live in a house. It's not a huge house, but it's a nice house, and the payment is something that they can afford. And, got great kids, good relationship with the kids, has time to be involved in church, on and on and on. And some of Susie's friends work, and so she begins to get the idea that if she would go to work, that she could be a career woman like her friends as well as a stay-at-home mom. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with working. If that's what you want to do, I think that's great. But it's not the best choice for everybody. Different people can handle different things. And I do believe if working is going to, as a mom, is going to cause a lot of strain on your family, then you don't want to make the choice to do it just to have a little more money because you won't end up with as much money as you think you will anyway. By the time you pay the babysitter, pay federal tax, state tax, city tax, social security tax. <laughs> I think here you have VAT tax. That, you know, it's just, <laughs> it all gets into fat tax and more tax and more tax. Amen. I'm not saying that it's wrong to work. Many of you are single moms and you have no choice. You have to work not only one job, but two. And some of you, I mean, a lot of times today it requires two incomes to go to work. But I'm just, I'm just being hypothetical here. Don't make life-altering decisions based on money. That's the main thing I'm trying to say. Don't let money be the decision breaker for you. Do you have peace about it? Is it going to be good for your whole family? Are you going to regret it later on and think it through? What are you really going to get out of it when all is said and done? I can tell you right now, no amount of money is worth your peace. And no amount of money is worth the stress that you end up with if you've got a schedule that never leaves you any time for anything except to run, 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 run all the time. Surely we can understand that God has got a better life for us than to just run, go, 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 and run. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? And I did it for years and thought I was doing it for God. Now, was I supposed to do what I did? Yes, absolutely. But there was a lot of things I could have said no to that I didn't. And that would have given me more time at home. I can't get that time back now. Thank God I do have good relationships with my kids. But there was probably some things that could have been avoided had I been at the right place at the right time. All right, I've made you all itchy enough. I'll move on. <laughs> In Mark chapter 10, we see a young rich man. And I want us to go look at this guy because... There's a lesson here that we can't pass up if we're going to talk for a minute about money. There was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. Don't kill, don't steal, honor your mother and father, on and on. He said, I've done all that. What else can I do? And he said, Jesus, verse 21, and Jesus looking upon him, loving him, said to him. I'm stressing the loving him because... You're going to see that God is getting ready to ask him to do a really hard thing, but he asked him to do it because he loved him. You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have. <laughs> Woo! And give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and accompany me walking the same road that I walk. Now, many people misunderstand this, and they think to serve God, they can't have anything. And I hate it when people think that because the Bible says, I would above all else you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God wants us to be blessed. He told this young man that because he knew that his money was a problem for him. 
And it says that the young man, verse 22, and at that saying, the young man's countenance fell and was gloomy, and he went away grieved and sorrowing. Now watch this. For he was holding great possessions. The key word there is holding. He was holding great possessions. Now, look at the next verse. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, with what difficulty will those who possess wealth and keep on holding it, <laughs> keep on holding it, enter the kingdom of heaven? That's why the best thing that you can do is be as generous as you possibly can be and never let that spirit of greed get hold of you. Because I can tell you, if you let it get hold of you, enough is never enough. Some of you right now have more than you ever thought you'd have in your whole life, and it doesn't satisfy you for long. You want more. Thank you. Three people over here who understand. Come on now. The big house is not big enough, and the car is not new enough, and on and on and on and on and on. And I, you know, I'm... I think it's great when you can be blessed and have every good thing, but we need to be givers, 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 givers. Don't let money make your decisions. If your marriage is in trouble, be sure you make the right choice. Now I wonder how many people watching right now by TV. They've got problems in their marriage, thinking about a separation, thinking about a divorce. And if you're divorced, I'm not trying to condemn you. I was divorced when I was in my 20s, and I needed to be divorced. My husband ran around on me with other women. When I got pregnant, he told everybody the baby wasn't his, which was a lie. He ended up going to jail for stealing. But after I was married to Dave for not too many years, Dave prayed for a wife and he asked God to give him somebody that needed help and he got his prayer answered. <laughs> Majorly got his prayer answered. And what I'm going to tell you tonight happened about 38 years ago. So I guess Dave and I had been married maybe about seven years and something like that. And I still remember we were, we, we were standing in the bedroom of the first house that we owned and we had these mirrored closet doors, and I was getting something out of the closet, and I was smart-mouthing Dave about something. And he just very calmly, in an even voice tone, said, you have just about got me to the point where I can't stand you. And he said, if things continue the way they are, then I honestly don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I had a choice to make, because up until that time, I'd always blamed everything on Dave. The way I acted was because I'd been abused and the way I acted was because I was working and trying to be a stay at home, you know, trying to take care of the kids and I had too much to do and, you know, Dave played golf on the weekends and I this and this and that and he didn't this and this and this and that. But I could hear the seriousness in his voice. It was kind of like a warning. And you know, we get a lot of warnings in our life from the Holy Spirit, but we're very good at ignoring them. You know, if your spouse is saying, I don't feel like I ever see you, or I don't feel like we really talk, that's a warning. Pay attention to the warnings. Is anybody listening to me? If you're tired all the time, that's a warning. That's not the kind of life that God wants you to live. <laughs> if you're frustrated all the time, that's a warning. You need to make a change in life. But what we always want is we want everything around us to change. We want all the other people in our life to change. We want all of our circumstances to change. We want our life to change, but we don't want our lifestyle to change. Now that's worth writing down. God, I just want you to change my life. So he gives you a couple things to do. You don't want to do them because if you do them, then that means a lifestyle change. No, we don't like that. Well, I made a decision that day that I believe was a destiny-altering decision. I decided that I needed to change. And I had a chat with myself. If you don't change, 
your husband is probably going to leave you. And I made a decision to change, and I asked God to change me. Too many people decide to give up when their marriage is in trouble. They want the other person to change, but they don't say, God, change me. I shudder to think, and as I was preparing these messages, some of these decisions that I made, I remember making these decisions. And what if I would have said to him that day, well, buddy, you just do what you want to because the problem is not me. <laughs> now, here's the thing. If I would have done that, I wouldn't be here tonight. And I want to tell you, when I asked God to change me, it wasn't like he waved some magic wand the next day I was nice. I mean, it took years of God dealing with me and dealing with me, and I'll never forget. A year had gone by, and I had tried so hard to be good. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I just was, like, nicer than I ever thought I could be. And I, and I don't even know if Dave remembers it, but I said to him one day, I just want to know how you feel about me now. <laughs> and I was expecting to get this, honey, you've done so good. And and he looked at me and he said, better. Because <laughs> see, my behavior was so bad. I was, I was just selfish and self-centered. And really, you know what the honest truth was? Nobody had ever really taught me how to live. I knew how to go to church, but I didn't know how to live. I had some good doctrine. I knew about the virgin birth and the trinity and communion and baptism and, I mean, I had all that, but I didn't know how to live. <laughs> and several years ago, God told me, I want you to teach my people how to live. And I'm trying to teach you how to live, how to live the life that Jesus died and bled for you to have. I want you to live and not be frustrated and upset all the time and full of hatred and bitterness and anger and mad at everybody because you're not happy. Why don't we just grow up and say, I'm going to take some responsibility. I'm going to be responsible for me. If I'm acting bad, it's not your fault. It's my choice. Well, I'm not going to, I'll change, but I want them to change too. <laughs> Come on now, this is big right here. Well, I'll change if you'll change. You know what? You need to change whether they change or not because you're going to answer to God for yourself and not for them. <laughs> and any one of us that's going to say that we're living for the glory of God, then we have to be willing to make right choices no matter what anybody else does. Many of these decisions are life-altering decisions. Let's just look at two more scriptures here. Deuteronomy 7, 1 and 2. When the Lord your God, now he's talking to the Israelites who had enemies. They were all these ites, the Hittites, the Jergesites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites. We've all got our own ites. <laughs> you know, it's the grouchy bossites, the bad neighborites, the backacheites, the povertyites, you know, the kidites, the husbandites, the wifeites. We've all got them. So let's look at it in perspective. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you are entering to possess, and he has taken away Many nations before you, the Hittites, the Jergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, <laughs> seven nations greater and mightier than you. Now watch this. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you, and I believe when God puts it in your heart that it's time to deal with something in your life, it is at that time that he's giving that over to you. 
That's why you dare not wait till your time. Because if it's in God's timing, it's going to have an anointing on it that's going to cause a flow and make it easy. But if you wait for your time, so when I got that confrontation from my husband after seven years of marriage, why did he confront me that day? Because it was God's time. He had given me enough time to receive some healing from my abusive past. I was rooted enough in God now that I wasn't too likely to bolt and run. And at that particular moment, when I got that confrontation and I felt that pain in my soul that we all feel when we know we've been had, God was giving me that enemy of the bad attitude that I had. That bad attitude was my enemy. And if you have a bad attitude, it's your enemy. Don't sit there and look so innocent. <laughs> if you're selfish, it's an enemy. If you feel sorry for yourself, it's an enemy. If you've got a chip on your shoulder, it's an enemy. <laughs> and when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you smite them, now watch this, then you must utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor shall you show them any mercy. Okay, you know what we do? We say, well, yes, I want to deal with this, and, but. And then we give all the reasons why we are the way we are. You got to be brutal with your enemies. <laughs> I mean, the Bible says if your eye offends you, pluck it out. <laughs> if your hand offends you, cut it off. And that's kind of brutal language. What was he saying? If there's something in your life that is offensive to your walk with God, then cut it. Get rid of it. Don't flirt with it. Don't play around with it. Don't make excuses for it. Just change. Now, nobody can change themselves. And I want to make that clear as I leave you with these thoughts. Whatever decisions you need to make, you do have to make the decisions. God won't make them for you. You have to make the decisions. I want to change, but God, I know I can't change without you. And whatever change you want to see made, then you best start praying. And you need to stay on it every day telling God, I know I'm nothing without you. I can't change this without you. It's not really our job to change ourselves. It's our job to agree with God. And to stay in the Word in that area and study the Word. The Word has power in it to save your soul. James 1. If you will study the Word, not just read it for some exercise, but I mean study the Word. Study the Word and make a college course out of whatever your problem is. And as you feed yourself with the Word of God, that spiritual part of you will get stronger than that fleshly part of you. And God will give you victory. The war is on, and you're not going to let your enemies win anymore. It's time to get rid of all the ites and make right choices. Can anybody say amen? Well, godly wisdom is one of the most important and the most precious things that we can attain. And the Bible does say to seek wisdom. Proverbs 8, 11 says, For skillful and godly wisdom is better than rubies or pearls, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared with it. And if we seek the wisdom of God for our daily decision-making, we won't live in regret later. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and, you know, taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded, 
and he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident. And when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now. And so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Wilt u mee helpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl partner. You know, I don't think that we can underestimate the power of habits in our lives. First, we form habits, and eventually they form us. In my new book, Making Good Habits, Breaking Bad Habits, you'll discover that the freedom from bad habits lies in filling your life with one good habit after another. And with God's help, I believe you can put an end to struggling with bad habits and discover a new level of success in your life. Get my new book today. In dit boek vertelt Joyce hoe het aanleren van goede gewoonten je leven kan verbeteren. Nu ook verkrijgbaar op DVD. En profiteer van de zetkorting via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Joyce Meyer die is toch van tv? Wat doet ze nog meer? Ze schrijft boeken. Er zijn ook DVD's. Themaboekjes, mokken. Hé, hey, dat kan ik allemaal niet onthouden. Daarom is er de Joyce Meyer Info- en Productbroschure. Die kan je kosteloos bestellen. Online of telefonisch. Super!